compelling things about your article, um, at least to me, is you talk about how Eric Adams' coalition kind of um, paradoxically managed to include a pretty broad base of Black and Latino uh, working class voters. But then at the same time, on the other side, a lot of like wealthy, evil developers and landlords. So um, can you, now that the campaign is you know over, Eric Adams is mayor, can you talk a little bit about how he assembled this kind of unlikely coalition? Sure. So it's less unlikely than it looks. There actually, you know, is is a long history of, you know, moderate Black or Latino politicians in New York City, moderate white politicians as well, um, who draw close to the real estate industry, um, to the finance elites. You know, even Bill de Blasio himself was close to the real estate industry. What sets Adams apart, I would say, certainly from de Blasio is the enthusiasm with with which he embraces really, you know, the wealthiest people in the city and his um, more more hesitancy around uh, tenant issues and helping tenants. I think he's very much a, a real estate and finance mayor. At the same time, because he is a black man, because he did grow up in a working class neighborhood in Queens, he does have a feel for the working class. And he, in some ways, is like Michael Bloomberg in his political orientation, that I would say he's fundamentally neoliberal. But unlike Michael Bloomberg, you know, he has some real demographic and political strengths. Michael Bloomberg was not a Democrat. Eric Adams is very much a Democrat, close to the uh, Brooklyn Democratic Party and Queens Democratic Parties. You know, he is someone who can use identity uh, as, as a weapon. You know, Michael Bloomberg was a drab white man and a Republican in the Democratic city. Eric Adams is not that. So he has a lot going for him. He, he's a talented politician. He's a sometimes a strange politician. And I say for the left broadly, and certainly for socialists and, and for progressives, he is a very canny, wily, and potentially um, very strong opponent if indeed he comes against them or they seek to move him on certain policy issues and goals. So talk a little bit of more a little bit more about how he kind of utilizes his identity because that's something that you've you you've sort of um broken down in the past and I think it's really interesting because in a way it's I would say that it's different from how, you know, progressive NGO types are used to talking about identity, uh, but at the same time he uses it quite effectively. So give some examples and and talk about why that is so useful in in terms of defanging left attacks. Eric Adams is really interesting because he's simultaneously an anti-woke <laughs> democratic mayor and someone who is very adept at using woke rhetoric when it suits him. And so anti-woke in the sense that he campaigned very explicitly on being against the defund the police movement. His, his almost entire campaign was oriented around cracking down on crime, on being tough on criminals you know, he's a former police captain, and this was very central to the campaign to the point where there were really no serious or memorable policy proposals. It was very much about, I will get the city under control, very classic sort of um, campaign that would have been run by a white moderate not too long ago. At the same time, he is someone who, when it suits him, will invoke identity to try to shut down his opponents. I use an example during the campaign where I asked him very explicitly, would he support you know, stronger um, tenant laws and rent stabilization? Would he appoint more tenant-friendly members to something called the Rent Guidelines Board, which sets rent for the many rent-stabilized apartments in New York City? And he gave a, a very disingenuous but fascinating answer where he talked about, well, there are a lot of Black homeowners who may be hurt by rent stabilization, hmm. who need to pay their mortgages, you know, and he invoked some, you know, mythical person who, if rent stabilization were to be strengthened in some way, they could fall behind their mortgage and lose their home. And it was, it was completely disingenuous because most apartments in New York City are owned by these massive real estate companies. Uh, the, 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 even the small landlords, so-called small landlords are owning multiple apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. But again, he talked very explicitly about his black identity to shut down a discussion about rent stabilization and rent control. 
very recently he defended hiring his own brother for a very high paying job with the NYPD by saying he has to defend himself from white supremacy. And of course, who talks about white supremacy? Well, we know the NGO class is always talking about white supremacy. Robin D'Angelo, Ibram Kendi, right? There's an entire uh, industry dedicated to rooting out white supremacy. And of course, America is very much a racist country in many ways, but we know that there are also a lot of hucksters out there who are looking to make a, a lot of money off of that. So my, my point is in general is he's, he's a very difficult person to get a handle on. I think he does pose a lot of challenges for the left because he knows how to pivot very well. He knows how to use their rhetoric very well against them. In some ways, I view him as a more adept and uh, more nimble Lori Lightfoot, uh, hmm. who is the mayor of, of mm -hmm. Chicago and also uses identity. I think Adams is a stronger, cannier version of her with a much more stable coalition behind him. I, I want to um, pause on his rhetoric for a minute because something else that you recently wrote about was uh, this this sort of gaffe that he made recently where he referred to low wage workers as or frontline workers as uh, low skilled. And this we actually have a video of this. So um, maybe let's take a watch first and then I'll get your thoughts. If my businesses are sharing with their employees, you are part of the ecosystem of this city. My low skilled workers, my cooks, my dishwashers, my messengers, my shoe shine people, those who work in Dunkin' Donuts, they cannot, they don't have the academic skills to sit in a corner office. They need this. We are in this together. So uh, as I was saying, this comment really set off a firestorm among progressive commentators. Uh, you have, you know, uh, progressives, uh, pro progressive politicians in the state of New York, you know, going after Eric Adams now saying that this is a very insulting way to refer to service workers. They're low wage workers. You know, uh, uh, every worker is a skilled worker. And, you know, there's part of me that very much understands that critique. But I think that something interesting that you pointed out is that um, it wasn't really an effective way of countering what he was saying. And so so talk a little bit about what Eric Adams said there and why you don't think it was really the misstep that some people thought it was. So would I, if I were a politician, talked about, would I talk about workers in, the, in, in that way? And the answer is no, I, I would not. But the trouble is the point Adams was making was ultimately a valid one. If I also would argue he misses the bigger point about low wage work. So what he was saying, quite frankly, was the economically depressed midtown and downtown corridors that are lacking both tourist foot traffic and lacking in white collar workers who are still working remotely, these areas are very dependent on white collar professionals who patronize them because it's the low wage workers, you know, it's your dishwashers, it's your cooks, it's your cashiers. These are the people who are able to make a living because their businesses are being patronized by this upper middle class, this office class that, you know, for many decades is what supported these areas. And as we know with COVID, remote work has taken off. There's a lot of companies who are very reluctant, rightfully so, to not bring their workers back full time. So what Adams is saying is it's time for these corporations to bring their workers back. So dishwashers and cooks and all these various blue collar workers can then make a better living. Because while New York City itself is doing fine, these classic business districts are undoubtedly struggling. And I agree with the critics of Eric Adams that he did not phrase this very well. And also he should talk about getting these workers into unions, getting them better wages. That should be the discussion, right? I agree with that 100%. But again, you, you saw what happened. And, and this is why I warned the left about Eric Adams last year. AOC came at him on Twitter. She, she did her, her usual playbook, which is quote tweet, start, you know, start something of a firestorm, you know, a, a rightful firestorm in some ways, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Eric Adams stood his ground. He said, well, you're not, don't be the word police. I, <laughs> I was a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I worked in a restaurant. I know what it's like. And he grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, which is very much a working class black area. AOC grew up in Westchester, middle class. I grew up middle class too. There's nothing wrong with growing up middle class. But you saw, you know, in some ways, a, a clash of the professional class, um, you know, 
progressive world against the Adams working class world. And there are working class people who would not disagree with Eric Adams and who'd hear his words and go, well, yeah, you know, he's kind of right. Or they wouldn't even make the distinction between low skill and low wage, right? So mm. I do think he's going to be very adept at repelling these attacks. And AOC, for one, can't treat him like you would a Ted Cruz, where you get on Twitter, you get into a flame war, and then you walk away victorious and you go fundraise off of it. Very different story here. He's the mayor of New York City. He's a Democrat. He's black. He has working class pedigree. You got to come at him, come at him differently, particularly if you want to oppose him on policy. And it's not going to be so simple. And I think mm -hmm. this first little controversy showed that. So I think then, you know, the the final question for you to just kind of tie everything together is um, what can the left do when it comes to Eric Adams? Because I think a theme of your reporting on Eric Adams has been uh, that in so many ways, he is like almost invincible to left attacks, right? So what should the left do uh, for the next four years in New York if we really don't have any influence over the mayor? So I don't want to say he's invincible. I mean, no one's invincible. And, and being mayor of New York City is a very high stress job and inevitably press cycles turn against you. So I think the left is much stronger in New York than it used to be and is very adept at using the media in, in, in ways it, it, it wasn't always, you know, five or six years ago. I think someone like AOC should re-engage on New York City issues a lot more and not just parachute in for these little kind of controversies. I think she's very much a national politician. That's great. Um, but, you know, people like her can really use their leverage more on particular issues, certainly uh, around tenant issues. You know, I look toward the rent guidelines board, putting pressure on Eric Adams to appoint tenant friendly members. Now, the, the good news for the left, too, which used to be the bad news for the left, is that the state has a lot of power over New York City. And that used to be bad news because Republicans control the state Senate. No longer true. Now you have many progressives and even socialists in the state legislature. Two DSA members are in the state Senate. Several more are in the state assembly. And you can work around Eric Adams. You can pass laws in the state legislature. You can force them to the desk of Governor Kathy Hochul, who is not the centrist that Andrew Cuomo was, and she's more amenable. And you can pass laws and do a lot without his input at all. So I think on one hand, focusing on state issues will be very important because the state has a lot of power over New York City. And I think for the city council, it's about keeping the progressive and socialist bloc organized there, you know, really coming together, being united around votes, putting pressure. You know, if you combine the progressive and socialist lawmakers, you have a pretty sizable plurality or something close to plurality in the New York City Council. So there is a lot of room to work with on, on bills and on policy. I, I think just the thing to keep in mind is, and I think most people are aware of this, you can't just follow the social media playbook or follow the playbook of let's try to catch Eric Adams in a gaffe, right? It, it almost right. reminds you of Trump. Oh, we're going to get him this time, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really work. And it, it didn't work on Trump. It's not going to work on Eric Adams, especially when you, you try to attack him on issues where if you really break it down, it, it wasn't so damning or controversial, right? The point mm -hmm. he was making. And, and I think you have to be very judicious about the issues you take on, really focus on policy, stay organized and stay together too, you know, stay, stay united, especially uh, if he tries to make life difficult for the left, which he might, he, he hasn't so much yet, but it's early. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.